<clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm kind of an outsider here. Don't work with ENCODE at all. But, uh, I think about the problems that ENCODE also faces in my own work. My background is actually, uh, I spent 30 years um, training in biochemistry and studying genome uh, or gene regulation uh, from a mechanistic point of view in the past 15 years doing it on a uh, genomic scale. And um, as I was listening here, some of the things that really resonated with me was, uh, I think Joe may mentioned this, but it was sort of the PI vision. Um, and it's really, you know, that the how of each of these elements. I think when we talk about how do these elements work, we really mean mechanistically. How are they pushing proteins around? How are they working with each other? The whole conglomerate of factors. And when we think about the whole conglomerate of factors, there's sort of one thing that's kind of, you know, missing from this whole thing, the elephant in the room, and that is uh, if you get beyond the functional elements themselves, there's a, there's a world of factors uh, there. And uh, beyond the chromatin, beyond the sequence-specific factors, uh, there's the chromatin regulators. And I, I know some of these things are covered under ENCODE, but um, at least from my perspective, they, they seem to be afterthoughts. And it's really, the, you know, the, the primary focus is on the sequence-specific factors. But you have these vast number of regulators. You have a, the initiation machinery and the transcription machinery and the elongation factor. All these guys are going to be working together. Um, as one massive complex, and I think it's really important to understand how all of these guys work together. Um, so that's, that's the entirety of it. So when you think about mechanisms, um, here's a mechanism, a uh, car a steering mechanism, uh, and, w and we can think about our bodies as mechanisms, and, and, and when things break down, um, you need a mechanic for the car, but for us, we need drugs, uh, and how do we get drugs, but we need to understand mechanisms, and how do we get mechanisms, but it brings us all the way back to the top, and the concept of how do we take all this genomic data to get to these mechanisms. And the first phase, um, really, in this process is called co correlations, and we've been doing a lot of that, uh, and that works really well. But uh, correlations is like saying, okay, you have a steering wheel, a rack, a pinion, here's the target. They're all kind of correlated with each other. They're all in the same place. But that doesn't mean we understand what they do. So we need to go to that, that next phase. And, there's three parts to it that I see, because um, correlation is not causation. Um, we have to determine causation and um, structure and dynamics. And, and the way I think about it is causation really comes down to making genetic perturbations in the system. So over here, if you took this rack away, well, what happens? Well, these wheels won't turn, but the steering wheel will turn, and this drive shaft and, the, and this gear will turn. So we know parts of it will turn, other parts won't. So that's, that's causation, and we'll know what the wheel can do up to this point and uh, the steering wheel, but not beyond that, all right? The second is uh, high-resolution assays. Um, if you look at this structure here, you can pretty much guess what it does. So if you have a really high-resolution view, and I'm talking about base pair resolution view of the genome, you can just get a visual on what it is, and that's going to be quite helpful. And finally, time course, you, you can get a better sense of how things work when you see them moving and changing with time. But I, I'd emphasize I don't think time courses are, are necessarily causation. They can be along very parallel paths, but not necessarily causation. And really, um, the whole process of knocking things out and looking downstream of that may be uh, a more effective means of causation. I put a red X next to functional assays um, and states because, at least for me, the, these, th these concepts, you know, histone, um, uh, chromatin states, and things like that weren't necessarily resonating with me um, because, in part, they're either out of context or um, uh, they're, they're rather low resolution. And if we get into things like causation, structure, and dynamics, uh, I think these things fall out um, from that, that you'll get function and, and you'll get uh, more detailed uh, definition, and therefore states go away. So when I think about um, states, I think about in resolution, uh, here's a, sort of an aerial uh, image of actually a, a schoolyard. Uh, and you, you can get lots of things from it, but at low resolution, I kind of think of chip sig at this kind of resolution, you get certain types of information to be quite useful about where things are, um, but the details are kind of lost. Uh, if you get much higher resolution, you can get into the details and change the questions that you're asking. You get much more specific. You can see how all the parts fit together. So that was the whole visualization component that I was mentioning. You have the, the details, and one concrete example of that is uh, FOXA2 transcription factor. Uh, we were doing some of this work with uh, Ken Zaris lab. And essentially, you know, it's the chip exo assay that you can use this exonuclease to chew up the chip data and chew up the borders so you can get pretty high resolution. And uh, with uh, Ken's lab, we found 35,000 
a size uh, for that, each one of them with a, a binding motif. And if you blow that region up, you can see that you, know, you can get the chip exo um, sort of midpoint between the two peak pairs where the exonuclease stop. And you know, each of these columns is a single base pair. So you get really base pair resolution. You can line this up to the structure of the protein. And in fact, if you just line up the sequence there for each of these columns, uh, you'll see they line up with the nucleotides. So these three green things here, T, 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 you see up here, and then this G is the gold. And then finally, this midpoint between the blue and the red is the cross entry point. So you can define it right here. So you get pretty, pretty, uh, we, we use this actually for structural information. It's great when you have the actual crystal structure because you really need it to interpret the data. Okay. So um, the charge that I had here was about coming up with a proposal, proposed set of work. All right. And so this is what um, I'm going to describe to you. And um, really it comes down to, you know, like a proposal, you'd have, you need to have some background and then you need to propose some experiments and things like that and feasibility. So um, for this cartoon purposes, these uh, monikers will be the genome is ACTG, the epigenome sits on top of that, that's the blue box, and then the environment. And to me, there's really two major factors uh, that one could change in a system. It's either the genetic change or you can environmental change. That's really all there is uh, if you're talking about doing high throughput sequencing to look at the uh, epigenome. Uh, so there's these two types of perturbations. And of course, each one of them creates an epigenome change, and the epigenome change uh, goes on and creates a phenotype. So this is kind of the framework that I think about things. And I want to um, just use one example here. Um, you know, as in a proposal, you might have some preliminary results. This is our sort of chip exoassay of a protein. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, the, the window here is about 100 base pairs from here to here, just to give you a, a sense of the framework. And this is promoter regions of a set of genes where this protein is bound. And if you elicit a genetic change, it turns out a, a protein that regulates this thing, uh, the, the conformation changes, but it's only at a subset of genes to which um, this protein is, is more broadly spread. Um, so through, through these mutations, we can get a sense of what's happening here mechanistically. Now, there's a lot more to this. I'm going to show you in a much more um, descriptive manner. Uh, and, and I'm going to take this data here, which you're all familiar with as, as, as heat map. I'm going to turn it into an abstraction. And then I'm going to start layering other data sets over it and how it informs us of mechanisms. And this is what you see uh, here. So for example, um, there's about 100 genes here, okay, and it's just, it's just average data through. So these are one set of genes, another set of genes, and so on. And you have a blue protein bound and, and this red protein spread across here, and then this green and the black. And if you actually go through this genotypic change where you actually remove the blue, the red collapses, the green expands out. So this is spatially what happens. Uh, but instead, if you, you went and did an environmental change, the blue also goes away, but the red stays broad and the green goes away. And then this black thing moves in. So there's all sorts of these, these microscopic or, or base pair level changes that take place when you go through either you knock out a factor and ask what downstream things happen, or you create an environmental change and you ask what downstream events happen. But really what that takes is having a look at the individual proteins at high re spatial resolution so you can separate them all from each other. So in terms of a proposal, the idea would be simply, and this is, anybody could think of this as just fairly straightforward, you have all your various cell systems, I don't care what they are, because from my perspective, we work in yeast, we work in flies, we work in mouse, we work in humans. I don't really care what the organism is, I just care about mechanism. I, I care to understand how all these proteins work together, and fundamentally from yeast to human, um, those mechanisms, you can think of them regardless of the organism. So you take your cell type uh, and now you do your, your various, throw your various tools at it that you have. Your dynamics is going to be time points. You can do your CRISPR-Cas9 uh, based deletions and then plus or minus perturbations. And you go through this and you, then you run through your assays and you stick to your quality control metrics. Okay? So um, part of any proposal requires budget. And so Ross came up with 800 million. Uh, did you come up with a budget for that, Ross? <laughs> no, I'm still working on it. <laughs> Not enough money in the universe. So, so to get reasonable about it, uh, and this is just a, a, sort of a, a down payment on, on Ross's uh, proposal, um, is to say, okay, well, if you took 10 cell types and you took three time points through that, 
and, and five deletions of, let's say, the sequence-specific transcription factors, and you were just trying to look at 22 factors in particular, of course, you'd need to do replicates. I put three down. You want two to hold, one in case it doesn't work for that assay. So uh, you add that up, you get 22 uh, and, and, uh, of these um, factors right here. And that's, that's about 10,000 assays right there. It seems like rather simplistic, uh, but, but you do the multiplication and it's about 10,000 assays. If you can get it down to $200 an assay uh, plus some fixed costs, you're up to about $3 million just in this project. So, in, you know, th these are fictitious numbers, but they're uh, hopefully reasonable. Uh, that's the kind of um, a project that may be feasible, uh, uh, you know, for, for or one proposal, I would guess. Okay, so now um, this gets down to sort of um, my last slide, really, uh, and that is how to actually make this thing happen. Uh, and this is kind of, uh, some of this, I think, again, I'm a, sort of an outsider looking at code and code, so I don't fully understand the details of it, but it strikes me, you know, really what you need uh, and have already is just basically a pipeline, data production and processing pipeline. So you make it and then you analyze the data. Uh, one idea would be the community samples come in, so they can be anybody who's interested in this, or perhaps even through an RFA, come in. And I think what, what really is key for me here is this is a, a sort of single monolithic pipeline, if you will, um, that the data comes through, the, 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 the samples come in, they get processed, and they get pushed all the way through, and then finally it comes out the other end. This is the, the rapid release that the community can do analysis on. And the reason why I'm kind of keen on, on perhaps a monolithic, at least for the purpose of discussion, is because of standards, all right? I think really what's happened over the past many years has been a compromise, okay? Standards were hard to come by. They, they were years of negotiation. They finally happened, but really they were work in progress. And, and as, as, as we go on, I think we need to continue to improve those standards, but we also need to somewhat lock them down and hold different labs uh, accountable that may be processing uh, samples through the various assays. So um, some of the ena enabling uh, components, and so I'm going to get back to this in just a second, but uh, this is what I think that whatever runs the pipeline can control. For example, you have affinity capture. We talked about this today. Uh, antibodies. Antibodies can be a real challenge. I heard um, Mike that 75% of them in, a, in sort of a random test aren't very good. Um, so we need to get a hold of that and, and maintain uh, uh, strict standards. There's noise minimization, there's spatial resolution that's important. You can use the exonuclease, emanase, DNase, TN5, the, the uh, mapping 5 prime, 3 prime ends of RNAs. These are all some important high resolution methods that will give you a spatial picture of what's going on. I think it's important to look at these things in, the, in a native context rather than in, in reporter context because the native is going to be um, really the, the, the proper context in which this thing will be ultimately functioning in. Um, high throughput, uh, that's going to be critical, but I also think of it as true production versus variable compliance. True pro productivity or processing through, you might think of a car being manufactured in a plant. There's absolute standards, everything is done the same way. It isn't like, you know, one plant might manufacture a car slightly different than a different plant for the same model. So the question is variable compliance. I think that's going to be uh, important. Um, and, and perhaps finally, um, this, is, this is something actually gives some thought and I've really waffled on. Should, should the DCC be maybe something more of a line item? What I mean is, should it be open for funding, you know, determining whether it should exist or not? Or should it already be determined that this is what we need and it's going to exist? And really what the RFA should be about is how to improve it, how to adjust it, how to tweak it, how to do all sorts of things with it, but not question its existence, all right? Because I don't think we can really, we, we need something like this and I don't think that will ever go away. And I don't know if it's a good thing to have it pass around maybe from one academic site to another. It seems to be maybe we really want to lock it into um, place. Okay. Um, and I'll just, I'll just turn it over to this. Um, these are some questions that I think Elise sent over to ask to identify, and I'll just leave the answers there and answer any questions uh, that you might have. So, Frank, Frank you, your, your, 
you're proposing the sort of the sequencing center model for this, right? Well, um, I mean that you have you, that you say. Yeah, you and want, actually, one thing I, I which really, is sort of different than your one million, you know, your three million dollar project. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the, so a sequencing center, but not necessarily just one. You might have different pipelines here for different assays. I mean, I think Encode already does that, right? There, there's there's different labs have different specialties, and so you can use that. But but I really see this central pipeline as the DCC, coordinating not all of it, but also setting the standards, uh, both in terms of report every aspect of it, a lot more con centralized control. Also, I bought, when I bought, the, the last time I bought a Toyota, I got the one that was built in Japan, not the U.S., because it was better, because the doors closed differently. <laughs> so is Phantom better? <laughs> you know, Frank, I would say most of that already exists or is in place. Right. <clears throat> okay. So, so maybe I'm missing what you're proposing. I guess just to continue doing what we're doing. Yeah, no, no, that's okay. exactly the point. I mean, a lot of these things already exist. It's just from my outside point, these are just independently what I think yeah. should happen. They already okay. are there. And, and the point really is to wrap around the details, you know, improving it, tweaking this, and, and how it might be um, centralized. Well, so, wasn't the community sample input, wasn't that a change? Yeah, well, that was yeah. part of it. Yeah, right, that's what I, yeah. 